from father to son. And I think there's even a way today, there's a test you can take to see if you have a certain gene of the Kohen, a certain marker that could actually very predominantly prevalent amongst Kohenim that could give you a strong indication, although maybe not conclusive, whether you are a Kohen or not. So the Torah talks about the laws of the Kohenim. Now, what are the laws of the Kohenim? So let's look at the Torah portion. The first one, right off the bat, as they say, is lenefesh lo yitama biyama. A Kohen is now allowed to become defiled by a dead person. Now, what does that mean, defiled by a dead person? So here we get into another realm of Jewish law, a very broad subject called Tuma and Tara, purity and impurity. Now, we're not talking about defilement of the body or contamination of the body. This is completely spiritual. What are the things that defile a soul? So somebody is uh, pessimistic or somebody is... Um, uh, if somebody is, um, but if somebody is um, sarcastic, if somebody is has just a negative, uh, uh, somebody is depressed. If somebody is uh, bitter, right? Those are things that contaminate. You would say they contaminate the soul, right? They defile the soul. The soul should be in a state of joy, of love, of happiness, right? Generosity, right? So we're talking about a spiritual condition of a soul now. Sadly, what is it in life? You know, when you look at a child, a child by nature is, exudes joy and happiness. Children run around, they're carefree, they're always, right? When you become adults, they become, you know, in their head a lot. And sometimes they start walking, you know, feeling negative or sad or, you know, like I said, they could be uh, a little bit pessimistic or, uh, or you know, just more sarcastic, what, what causes that? So to a certain degree, the realities of life set in, you know, when you're a child, everything looks so beautiful, so wonderful. And then you experience some of the pains and the challenges of life. And it, it drains you a little bit sometimes of your positive, idealistic, happy perspective. So therefore the Kohenim had to be in a state of joy, in a state of deep connection and faith in God. And therefore, one of the prohibitions of the Kohanim is that they could not come into contact with a dead body. There's only seven relatives that a Kohanim is allowed to come into contact with, and that's the next verse in the sixth Torah portion, his closest flesh, God forbid, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, his sister, or his wife. Those are the seven funerals a Kohanim is allowed to go, be in touch with. Now, it's interesting that today, this law still pertains to Kohanim. Maybe some of you know, but when a Kohen goes to a funeral, he's not allowed to go where the body is, where the room is. If you ever go to a funeral, you see sometimes the, a, a religious Kohen is standing outside the chapel or standing by the road, not going to where the grave is. There's a lot of laws till today. Kohanim cannot become defiled. Now, it's a spiritual thing, really. I'm giving you a psychological reason about your mindset, about your perspective on life, when you come into contact with, with, with death and loss, and it makes you question, right? And, and perhaps can shake your faith a little bit. So, but the Torah says a corpse is a human being who had a soul, and the soul, as King Solomon says, returns to God who gave it. And now the corpse is hollow. It has a void, it has a a cavity, an empty space where there was once a soul. So holiness is God. God in the body of a person is holiness. When the person's soul departs, that represents impurity. And because of that, the body radiates contamination, so to speak. And the FO Cohen can't come into proximity of that. He cannot touch it, cannot even be in the same room of it. And just incidentally that you know, there are certain rabbis that are Kohanim, of course, and those rabbis cannot officiate at funerals, which is really something a rabbi usually does. But if the rabbi is a coin, it's a problem because tilted not coming into contact with the dead. Only, like I said, the exception of the seven immediate relatives, as the Torah says. So that is the 
opening law about the Kohanim. And many religious Jews who are Kohens don't become doctors. You know why? Because in medical school, you have to work on cadavers. And once again, they came, come into contact with the dead. So that's number one rule about the Kohen. Now, the, the positive commandment is that they shall be holy. They must conduct themselves in a state of holiness. Why? Because they have to go into the temple. They always have to be in a state of holiness. If a Kohen did come into contact with a dead body, they have to go wait a certain period of time and go to the mikvah and cleanse themselves and so on and so forth. There are then laws about who a Kohen may or may not marry. So a Kohen is not allowed to marry uh, a divorcee. A Kohen is not allowed to marry a woman who has been desecrated. A harlot, right? Once again, he has to conduct himself in a state of holiness. Now, you may say, why these laws? And one idea is that the Kohen harkens back to the days of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before. In that state, there was eternal life. It was before man was condemned. You come from dust, you shall return to dust. They were going to live eternally. So therefore, there's no contact with the dead. Adam and Eve were, met, were, were fashioned by God for each other. So there was no divorcees. There was no, um, there was no uh, women who were def- desecrated or harlots, right? So therefore, it, it takes you to that um, pre-exile uh, state in the Garden of Eden where there was only, you know, purity and holiness. It was a perfect idyllic world, the Garden of Eden, before the sin. So they maintain that level of um, holiness. What's fascinating, and just to throw this in, is that there's a special rule about the high priest. And of course, the other laws pertain to the high priest, surely. But there's one additional rule that applies to the high priest. And that is that while a regular priest is not allowed to marry a divorcee, the high priest is not even allowed to marry a widow. And the question is why? And again, I don't want to spend the whole class on this subject. We could talk about this at great length. Why can't a a Cohen marry a divorcee? I told you about Adam and Eve, but there's other reasons, psychological reasons, right? But we won't get into all of that right now because But as far as the widow, why can't a high priest marry a widow? And here we find a very interesting answer given. And that is that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And the concern is maybe he would uh, have an interest in a married woman. And maybe in his prayers, either consciously or unconsciously, overtly or unavertly, wish that this woman's husband would die so he could marry her. So by saying he cannot marry a widow, it sort of prevents him from even thinking about that because he wouldn't be able to marry her regardless. Now, why do I say that's a fascinating teaching? It's a fascinating teaching because who would suspect that the high priest, the holiest Jew, on the holiest day of Yom Kippur, in the holiest place on earth, in the Holy of Holies, would think about a woman that he likes and maybe not wish well for her husband so he could marry her? And then the Torah say, no, you can't marry her anyway, so don't even go there. But again, the Torah always reminds us of our human frailty and our, you know, susceptibility to sin. As it says in Ethics of Our Fathers, don't believe in yourself till the day you die. Everyone is susceptible. Everyone is, you know, human being who has weaknesses and therefore, yes, you may be the high priest on Yom Kippur and the Holy of Holies. It doesn't mean that you're invulnerable to a sin. So that is a very important lesson about understanding the human condition. And the Talmud says, Ein apotropis la raius, which means in, would mean to say no human being is beyond suspect when it comes to sexual immorality. We have many great biblical stories like this, and we have many stories in America of great leaders who fell prey to that. So nobody is above 
the human condition. And that's one of the interesting reasons why the Kohen Gadol cannot marry a widow. So that's a little bit about the Kohanim. And till today, again, if somebody's a Kohen, uh, sometimes you have a, a, a Kohen who's 40 or 45 or 50 years old. He's never been married. He wants to get married. He could only marry a woman who hasn't been married yet. And it's very hard because if he's already 50 years old, he has to find the, a lot of women at that age, let's say in their 40s, may have been divorced, but he can't marry a divorcee because that's still a law that's practiced and applicable today. Because even though the role of the Kohanim is not the same today, we don't have a temple, they don't bring offerings, but they still give the priestly blessings. They first get, they get the first honor at the Torah every time the Torah is read. And they're still treated in some regards, and therefore they are still maintaining some of their laws of Kohanim. So that is, and it goes on with other laws about the Kohen and how if they become defiled, they shall become cleansed because they have to be in a state of holiness. Now it's interesting to know that, as I said earlier, primarily the Kohanim are the holy ones of the nation of Israel, but all of the nation of Israel are commanded to be holy. And that's why it's interesting that in this week's Torah portion is where we have the commandment of you shall be holy and I shall be sanctified amongst the children of Israel and you shall not desecrate my holy name. So this is a very, very fundamental mitzvah for every Jew. And I want to just talk about it for a minute um, because here's where you see the Torah transitions from talking about the Kohanim's holiness to the holiness of every Jew. And this is a very important mitzvah. And actually, according to some opinions, it's the only mitzvah that even a child before bar bar mitzvah has to fulfill. And that's why I remember as a child, we were always taught this over and over again. And that is that wherever you go as a Jew, you are an ambassador of the Jewish people. Think of an ambassador. The ambassador from, I don't know, France comes to Washington and he lives in Washington. When people want to know what are French people like? They visit the ambassador's residence and they get to know the ambassador. When you go into the ambassador's, uh, the, the embassy of France, you learn all about French people, right? You didn't meet French people. You, don't, you haven't been to France, but through the ambassador, you know everything about the French people. And the same thing with the Australian embassy and so on and so forth. Think about a Jewish home and a Jew as being an embassy for the Jewish people. God says, you are my ambassadors on this earth. And therefore, you have to reflect the teachings and the values of the Torah and be that example for others to see what does it mean to be a Jew. And therefore, what you do is not just a private individual. You know, if, I don't know, John Smith does something bad, right? It's a reflection on himself. It's not a reflection on all Americans. Nobody would say, Oh, you see this American guy, he committed this crime. You see, all Americans are criminals. Nobody would say that. But when a Jew does something unbecoming, inappropriate, immoral, unethical, improper, what do people say? Oh, look at those Jews. This is what a Jew does. Why? Because we, whether we chose it or not, whether we like it or not, the fact is people look at you, you're a Jew, you're part of a very small group of people, less than a quarter of a percent of the world, and your actions reflect on the Jewish people. So when you do something noble, if you do something righteous, you do something selfless, you do something generous and kind, people say, wow, look at the Jewish people, how terrific they are. And it's a positive reflection on the Jewish people and on God, because God chose the Jewish people. But God forbid when you do something improper, then it's a negative reflection on the Jewish people and on God. And therefore, as Jews, we have a responsibility to draw people closer to Hashem through not only teaching the Torah, but to being an example of it. When people say, wow, look at this wonderful person, look how kind, considerate, thoughtful, whatever they say positive, that's a positive reflection. Then they want to learn more about the Torah and more about Judaism. So that is the commandment in this week's Torah portion that I shall be sanctified amongst the Jewish people. However, the Talmud says from this commandment to be sanctified amongst the Jewish people, we also learn the concept of praying with a minyan. That if we want to say Kiddushah or Kaddish or Baruch Hu or certain prayers, God says, I don't want to be sanctified just by one person. I want it to be a community. I want it to be amongst the Jewish people. And what is that? A minyan, a quorum of 10 people praying together. So that is 
where you see how every Jew is considered a Kohen and held to that responsibility of being an example and a, creating a Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name. And, you know, we've all been part of conversations where people brought up a Jew as an example of, wow, look at this amazing thing this person did. Or God forbid the opposite, look at that terrible thing, right? So when Bernie Madoff did what Bernie Madoff did, we were all embarrassed as Jews. We were like, oh, a Jew, look what he did. Now we're all embarrassed. Why are we all embarrassed? Because as Jews, we're all connected and all responsible and all reflective of one another. But when a Jew does something very kind, very, you know, very you know, outstanding and wonderful, right? And that's why, and it's funny, like when Jews read the news and they read about someone who did something really amazing, we write it, is he Jewish? Is he Jewish? We want to know if he's Jewish, because if he's Jewish, we're really proud. Look, he's a Jewish guy. Look what he accomplished. Look what he did. And when we see Jews in important positions doing great things, we're proud that look at that Jew. He's doing this or doing that. And that makes us all feel proud. So that's the idea of Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem, the, the, the God forbid not to cr create a desecration of God's name. And obviously, I just want to back up one verse. Before the commandment, it's, it happens to be in chapter 22, verse 32, it says, you not desecrate my holy name, I, but rather I should be sanctified amongst the Jewish people. The verse right before that says, observe my commandments and perform them. I am God. You want to know how you sanctify God's name? By observing the commandments and performing the mitzvot. That's the way we sanctify God's name. So that is pretty much uh, the subject of chapter 21 and chapter 22 of this week's Torah portion. The first two chapters are all about the Kohanim and their special rules, and also that we have to treat them with honor. That's why we give the first Aliyah to a Kohen, to honor them and their special role amongst the Jewish people. And... Now we come to the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, which is the center chapter of this week's Torah portion, which I told you is all about the Jewish holidays. And it actually has a special name. It's called Parshat HaMohadim, the Parsha dealing with the holidays. Now, which holidays? So there are actually... The first holiday is actually Shabbat. Now, we typically don't think of Shabbat as a holiday. But when the Torah begins all the holidays, it begins with six days you shall work, and the seventh day you shall rest. It should be a day of Shabbat. Now, why is Shabbat included in the holidays? So Rashi asked that question, and Rashi says, to teach you that the holidays are just as important as Shabbat. Why? Because there are certain things you're allowed to do on, on, on a holiday that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. For example, cooking. We're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. But on a holiday, we're allowed to cook. When Shavuos comes, we're allowed to cook. We could have a barbecue. You can't use electric, but you could have a fire prepared and you could cook food. Why? Because the holiday has a dimensions. The, yom, the Chagim, as we call it, the holidays, has one dimension above and beyond Shabbat. Shabbat is primarily a day of rest, a day of peace. However, the Shabbat is, is a day of peace and rest, but the day of the holidays are a day of joy. So for the joy of the holiday, cook on the holiday as opposed to Shabbat, that the food has to be cooked in advance of Shabbat. So you may think holidays aren't as holy as Shabbat. Why? Because you're allowed to cook, you're allowed to carry on, on a holiday as opposed to Shabbat. So the Torah says, no, Shabbat is the prelude to the holidays, saying all the holidays are as important as Shabbat. That's Rashi's answer. The Rambam gives a different answer, Maimonides. He says that it's teaching you that just like you're not allowed to build the tabernacle, when God told the Jews to build the Mishkan, they were not allowed to build on Shabbat. You have to cease work on Shabbat. Same thing is true with all the holidays. That on the holidays, you also have to cease doing any work on holidays. But be that as it may, the first holiday listed is six days God made the world, rested on the seventh day. Therefore, you should observe the day of Shabbat as a holy day. 
And also chronologically, before we had any of the other holidays, the first holiday uh, to come into being is Shabbat. When God made the world, he created in six days and rested on the seventh day. And that's when we were commanded to keep the day of Shabbat holy. So even though it doesn't sound like a holiday, when we begin chapter 23 of this week's Torah portion, the very first holiday listed is Shabbat. From Shabbat, we go to the next Jewish holiday. What's the next Jewish holiday after Shabbat? Passover. Because that's when we became a Jewish people when we left Egypt. So it gives us the holiday of Pesach. Then it talks about what we're doing now. Bringing the Karban Omer, the barley offering on the second day of Passover, and starting to count 49 days or seven weeks, the commandment of Svirata Omer, which we're in the middle of doing now, the 49-day count. And in the package we gave out on Passover, there was a booklet that shows you how to count to 49 days and a little meditation for each day, because each day we work on refining another aspect of our characteristics. So that commandment is in this week's Torah portion. And then you come to the 50th day after Passover, which is the holiday we're going towards, Shavuot, which will be on the 50th day of the holiday of Shavuot, commemorating the receiving of the Torah. So we went out of Egypt, but God says you're physically free, but you still have to become spiritually free. You have to undo the psychological shackles of Egypt, the spiritual shackles. Freedom is through studying Torah and connecting to God. So the Jews were so excited to get the Torah, like, you know, when you're looking forward to your wedding or some other you know, great day in your life. You, you know, you count the days. You can't wait. Well, we count the days. But it's not just counting the days to discard the days, like, oh, 10 days left to go, nine days left to go, and you just rip the days off the calendar and throw it away. You're building towards getting the Torah. So every day you work on yourself, and you build, and you build, and you build. So today is 26 days of the Omer. It doesn't even say it's the 26th day. It says it's 26 days, because I don't just have the 26th day. I have all the 26 days. So I have 26 days of the preparation towards getting the Torah. And tomorrow I'll have 27 days until we get the Torah. And the Jews counted the seven weeks in excitement, anticipation, enthusiasm to receive the Torah. So we have the counting of the Omer and then the holiday of Shavuot. What's the next holiday after Shavuot? Holiday after Shavuot, of course, is the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Which will be in another five months from now. And then 10 days later, the Torah talks about the holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Forgiveness. And then we come to the, the holiday of the seven days of Sukkot. And the Torah doesn't just tell us these are the holidays. The Torah gives us the instructions what to do on these holidays. So on Rosh Hashanah, you should blow the shofar. On Yom Kippur, you should fast. And on Sukkot, you should, besides the offerings that were bought in the temple that we're told, which we don't do today, but it tells us to take the four species, the lulav, the esrog, the dasim, the ravod, the four species to wave, tells us to eat in a sukkah for seven days, all the commandments of the um, holiday of Sukkot. So that is what is the entire chapter 23, which is known as Parshat Ma'odim. And I uh, may have mentioned the other day in the video that chapter 24 ironically starts with the commandment to bring the oil to the menorah. Now, when the Torah was written, there was no holiday of Hanukkah. But since then, there was the miracle of the Maccabees uh, defeating the uh, Syrian Greeks in the Second Temple era. And the next holiday after Sukkot became a rabbinic holiday called Hanukkah, which centers around the menorah. So it's just by divine providence, right after the Sukkot holiday, we start a new chapter with a new subject. But it happens to be about lighting the menorah, which later becomes the holiday that follows the holiday of Sukkot. Well, let's spend a little bit of time because this is a very, very fundamental section of the Torah, as I said, Parshat HaMaudim, the section that deals with the holidays. And like I said, on every holiday, we read from this Torah section. Okay, so it's a section that we're quite familiar with. But let us start with the, actually the word the Torah uses to describe holidays. Now, we have a more popular word that we use. We call it Chag, a Chag, right? Chag Sameach, a happy holiday, or the Chagim, the holidays, plural, right? Now the Torah does refer to it by saying Chag Pesach, Chag Matzot, Chag Sukkot, 
But in the introduction to the holidays, that's not what the Torah says. What the Torah says is Hashem told Moshe, speak to the children of Israel, the Amartalehem, and say unto them, Moade Hashem, which means these are the appointed festivals. The word in the Torah primarily is, Yachag means like a celebration. But why is it a celebration? Because these are the Moade Hashem the appointed times by God. So what does that mean? We often say the Moadim, Moadim Lesimcha, appointed times of holiday. Now, what is the meaning of the word? Why is these holidays called, you know, in English, a holiday means a vacation. It means I get to do whatever I want to do. I'm on vacation. There's no rules to a vacation. The whole idea of vacation is I have no rules. I can do whatever I want on my vacation, right? It's an oxymoron to say the rules of the vacation. Then it's not a vacation if I have rules. Our holidays are not, okay, go have a good time, whatever you want to do. No, you got to build a sukkah on sukkah. Then you can only eat in the sukkah. And you have to shake the four species. And on Yom Kippur, you have to fast. And on, uh, on Pesach, you have to eat matzah. You can't eat bread or leaven food. Every holiday has its commandments. By the way, the only one that doesn't have commandments. Why Shavuot has no commandments? A lot of customs that we created over the years, eat dairy foods, cheesecake, whatever, ice cream, stay up late and learn Torah, but there's no command just as a day of observance. Well, maybe we'll get to that soon because Shavuot is coming up. But so these aren't holidays in the sense of vacations, in the sense of appointed times what is appointment times it means an appointment everyone has a calendar right today people keep the calendar on their phone maybe right and you wake up in the morning you look okay what what appointments do i have today or what do i have appointments this week you know in other words you schedule time to do certain activities now it could be with someone else i have to meet somebody or go somewhere or it could be an activity you schedule for yourself. I'm going to go do this at this and this time today. I'm going to study that. I'm going to go here or whatever it is. Now, why is it important to have a calendar for yourself? You know, there's something called a to-do list. To-do list is a long list of things you have to do, right? And then you have a calendar. What's the difference? To-do list is like, these are the things I want to do or I need to do. But there's no time fixed to when you're going to do it the minute you put it in your diary the minute you put it in your calendar in your schedule now uh oh today at two o'clock i need to accomplish this and i have from two to three to accomplish it so i i attached a time to the duty and usually that's very helpful to make sure it happens because if you don't set a time it may never get done it may just sit on the to-do list so think about what god is saying what God is saying is, just like you have appointed times for everything else in your life, right? A lot of husbands and wives sometimes have a date night, right? Every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, we go out for dinner. Okay, why do I put it in my calendar? Because I may love my wife, but I'm too busy, she's too busy, we never get around to doing it, right? If you put it in the calendar, ah, it's Tuesday night, we got to get the babysitter scheduled in advance. We'll go. Then you know it's going to get done. Same thing with God. God says, make an appointed schedule time when you're going to spend time with me, with your relationship with God, which is the most important relationship in your life. So first of all, every seventh day, clear your calendar. It's booked in advance. For now, until the rest of your life, till 120, God willing, you're not available on Saturdays. Because Saturdays, you have a standing appointment reservation with God. You and God are going to spend time together for 24, 25 hours every Saturday. And you know your schedule in advance. If you ask me, where am I going to be, God willing, live till 120, when you're 80 years old on the Saturday, February 26th of the year, I don't know, you know, 2000, you know 2053. I know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in the synagogue on Shabbat. And I'm going to be at the Shabbat table on Friday night. How do you know what you're going to do in 30 years from now? Because it's in my calendar already for the rest of my life. Every Friday night, I'm going to be having Shabbat. That's what I do on Shabbat. So I'm telling God in advance, I've already booked all these dates to be with you, God, to study Torah, to listen to your words, to communicate with you, to pray to you, right? And then 
there's Rosh Hashanah, and there's Yom Kippur, and there's Passover, and there's Sukkot, and there's Shavuot. And that's what God is saying is you have to, just like any relationship needs to be a fixed schedule time, and just like you need fixed times to study Torah every day and so on and so forth. Those on the Zoom know, okay, every Tuesday, 12 o'clock, I study the Parsha. That's my schedule. And I don't book anything else during that hour because I know this is the hour I got to study. Same thing with Shabbat. Don't book anything else in Shabbat. Shabbat is my day for Hashem. And that supersedes anything else. So the first interesting thing is to know that it's called Moadim, which means designated set times. It's interesting that the, one of the names of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. It's the same thing. Just like there's a meeting in space, you know, when you have a meeting, you say, where am I going to meet you? I'll meet you here. I'll meet you there. Well, God says, this is the tent of meeting. Come to my synagogue. This is where you meet with me. So on Shabbat and holidays, we always go to the uh, synagogue, which was the replaces in modern times the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And that's where we have our appointed time and, and, and relationship with God. And that's the way we keep our spirituality and our holiness and our connection to Torah and mitzvot strong by reinforcing it through these regular meetings uh, you know, checkups, you know, uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah is like an annual checkup. You know, you go to your doctor for the annual checkup, right? Well, you need a spiritual checkup every year. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and so on and so forth. So this is the, uh, the, the way we do it. Now, to talk a little bit about the counting of the Omer, because it's in this week's Torah portion, um, there's so much to talk about the counting of the Omer, but just a few ideas. The first idea is that you should know there's a famous dispute about the counting of the Omer. There's two opinions. One opinion is that it's one long mitzvah that has 49 parts to the mitzvah because the Torah says you should count seven weeks. So it's the counting of all the seven weeks. According to this opinion, if you miss one day of the Omer, you can't continue counting because you didn't count all 49 days. You missed the day of the Omer. But the other opinion says, no, the Torah says count seven weeks, count 49 days. So every day is a separate day, a separate count. Just because you didn't count yesterday doesn't mean you can't count today. It's a big dispute in Jewish law because the Torah phrases the commandment in terms of 49 days and in terms of seven weeks. And the way we resolve it is that if you miss a day, you continue counting, but without a blessing. So every night you make a blessing, but if you miss a day, maybe you broke the count and now it's not a mitzvah anymore because you don't have the whole mitzvah. So you continue counting, but without a blessing. But be that as it may, you listen to someone else's blessing, you say amen. But what is the lesson to all of us? And I think there's a very practical lesson in our lives. When you look at time, there's two aspects to time, which are reflected in the counting of the Omer. One aspect of time is every day is a day unto itself. The other aspect of time is every day is marching towards a goal and a destination. So when you're living in time, as we all live in time, part of it is that time is you know, sometimes we look at time as a process to get somewhere. So let's say, I don't know, a student uh, goes into college and they want to get a degree and become uh, an engineer, right? And they're going to go study for four years. So every day is a day towards their goal. The goal is to graduate and become an engineer. So every day is part of the journey towards the ultimate destination of that goal. On the other hand, you could look at it like, Forget about the goal. Forget about the destination. Every day is a day unto itself. My accomplishments, what I studied, what I, what I achieved. To give you an example in Talmudic terms of this, two ways to look at time. The Talmud says that there was Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. We all know the famous two rabbis. And they had two approaches how to get ready for Shabbat. So what does that mean? So, you know, today's Tuesday. I don't know. Have you thought about Shabbat yet? Maybe not. It's only Tuesday. But by the time Wednesday and Thursday comes along, especially Friday, you're like, okay, what are my plans for Shabbat? 
what am I cooking? Am I going out to eat by somebody? Am I going to the synagogue? Like, Shabbat is coming, right? So there was a great rabbi in the Talmud. His name was Bet Hillel. I'm sure you've heard of him. And that's why the Hillel uh, on the college campuses is named after him. He said like this. He said, every day of my life, I eat in honor of Shabbat. Now, please tell me what that means. I understand on Shabbat, you eat in honor of Shabbat. And on Shabbat, you're supposed to eat in honor of Shabbat. I just want to take a minute to explain that. When you sit down Friday night to a delicious meal, fish and chicken and dessert, and right, the best, you know, a good cup of wine, right? You shouldn't be thinking I'm eating this for my enjoyment. You know why my table is so bedecked and laden with such good food? It's in honor of Shabbat. So yeah, I'm enjoying it too, but I'm also eating it in honor of Shabbat. And the same thing when you eat the chalant on Shabbos. So whatever you eat, in honor of Shabbat. Some people even say, the covered Shabbos Kodesh, in honor of the holy day of Shabbos. That's why on Shabbat we eat the third meal. In the olden days, people ate two meals a day. Shabbat, they honor it with a third meal. In honor of Shabbat, we have an extra meal. In honor of Shabbat, we have the wine, the Kiddush. In honor of Shabbat, we have the Chalot. But in honor of Shabbat, we eat the best food. So Hillel came along and said, I don't just eat on Shabbat in honor of Shabbat. Every day I eat in honor of Shabbat. Now, how, what does that mean? So he explained as follows. Hillel says, you know, on Sunday, I went to the marketplace. And when I saw a beautiful piece of fish, I said, ah, I'm going to buy this fish in honor of Shabbat. Because I'm going to get ready on Sunday to get the best beautiful fish for Shabbat. But then on Monday, he would go back to the marketplace and he would see a better piece of fish. So he would say, you know what? This is even better. I am going to buy this piece of fish in honor of Shabbat. And you know what he would do? He would go home and eat the first piece of fish. Because he would say, ah, now I got a better piece of fish. I don't have to save the first piece. So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eat. The so he says, why did I eat the fish that I bought on Sunday and Monday? Because I have a better piece for Shabbat. So therefore, he said, On Monday, I'm already eating in honor of Shabbat because I found a better piece of fish. So I'm eating. And then every day he would do that. But Shammai said, no, my approach is I just wait till Friday. And I trust that on Friday, I'm going to be able to find exactly what I need to purchase for Shabbat. But the idea, once again, is you could live every day towards Shabbat. That's what Shammai did. Shammai said, I want to feel Shabbat every day of the week. And therefore, I want to live towards that goal. Shabbat is an ideal state, a goal, and I'm working towards that goal of Shabbat. Okay, so that is the um, two dimensions of time as reflected in the Omer, the day-to-day -day count versus the goal and the ultimate destination of the journey of the 49 days of the counting of the Omer. Now, um, when it comes to the holidays, there is an overall theme that the Torah tells us about the holidays. And I'm just going to quote it to you. The Torah says that when you celebrate the holidays, it shouldn't just be a celebration for yourself, but rather you should invite in the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the, 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 the proselyte, uh, the Levite who doesn't have uh, his own provisions. In other words, the theme of the holidays is to be inclusive, to welcome everyone in together, to show generosity and, and kindness to those who maybe Shabbat and holidays should be the great equalizer. You know, during the week, maybe some people eat better than other people. Some have more, some have less. But when it comes to Shabbat and the holidays, this should be a day that everyone comes together. And everyone, and that's why till today, when you go to a Jewish home or wherever it may be on Shabbat, there's always guests at the table and there's poor people or needy people or whatever the circuit, everyone comes together. Shabbat is not just a day for you to sit by yourself or with your immediate family. It's to bring everyone together as a community. Those who have more, those who have less, those who are more fortunate, less, fortunate, those who have you know, if somebody doesn't have family, you invite them into your home so they feel as they're part of your family. So 
when you think about the holiday structure, what, basically what you have is the three joyous holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, as known as the Shalosh Rigalim, the three Jewish joyous festivals, right? That's the first one, right? But then in addition to that, in the middle you have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, why is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur right in the middle of the three major festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot? Because Pesach, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is different than the other holidays. They're not celebrating some great jo- occasion. Passover, the exodus from Egypt. Shavuot is the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Sukkot, the journeys in the desert. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as we said earlier, is personal days of reflection, of spiritual, as I told you, a checkup, spiritual checkup at the doctor, looking at the doctor of your soul, right? How's my soul doing? How's my spirituality doing? How's my holiness doing? How's my morals and my ethics and my righteousness doing? And why is it important that right in the middle of the three, if anything, God should have had the three holidays, major festivals, the three legs of like, like a stool, shalosh regalim, they're called, they're a set, if they're a set, Passover, Shavuot, why not either put Rosh Hashanah and Kippur in the, before them or after them? Why interrupting it? That after you have Pesach and Shavuot, you have Rosh Hashanah and Kippur before you get to Sukkot. And one of the answers is because if you're going to be socially inclusive on all of the holidays and embrace other people, that is very much dependent on your individual holiness and spirituality. In other words, if you don't work on yourself to be the best kind as generous, loving, caring, sensitive, compassionate person that you can be, you're not going to celebrate the holidays properly. And Jagil will tell you a very sharp line. Maimonides, when he talks about the holidays, he says a person who only celebrates with himself and his family and does not invite the poor and the needy and the stranger and the, the you know all the other people of the community who need a place. Maimonides says it's not a celebration of the holiday. It's a celebration of your stomach, he says, which is a very sharp line. He says, Sudat Kreso, it's a meal for your stomach. The whole idea of a holiday is not to fill your belly with food. The food is just a means to bring everyone together, to show kindness, to show love for your fellow man, for your fellow Jew. And therefore, in the oldest, most beautiful tradition, we always welcome guests. And it's something very beautiful, by the way, you know, Someone once said that Shabbat is the most exclusive club in the world. No membership dues, but it's the most exclusive club because it's an international membership. Anywhere in the world, you have unlimited Shabbat meals, holiday meals, celebrations, right? And think about it. A Jew could be anywhere in the world. He goes to the synagogue. I mean, I could tell you stories. You could tell me stories. You know, I remember. I traveled with the kids once. We were in Gibraltar. And we came for Shabbat. It's a nice little beautiful community in Gibraltar. And we arrived. I forgot where we flew in from. And we went to the local little dairy cafe to eat lunch. And we were basically, you know, ordered takeout food. We were staying in a hotel somewhere. And we were on the way through, I don't know, on the way to Israel or wherever we were traveling, Spain or whatever. And we called the local place and said, hey, we want to order takeout. We're going to eat in the hotel. As we're sitting in the restaurant, people noticed a new family in town because it's a small community. Everyone knows each other. And people started inviting us over for Shabbat meals. And we went to this one Friday night and this one Shabbat. We were in, we were in town for an hour. And we already had invitations for Shabbat. That's the way it works in a Jewish community. I've told you this many times. If you go to the Western Wall, Kotel, Friday night, there's a little guy there. His name is Jeff Sadell. The sweetest guy, he's like a short guy, he's like maybe five feet, five one, five two. And for 30 years or more, he's been standing in the same spot every Friday night. And he has papers with lists of names of families who in advance tell him how many guests they could send to his house for Shabbat. And imagine you come from Palm Beach, you come to Israel, you check into a hotel, come to the Western Wall Friday night, you have no idea where you're going to eat tonight. You could be you yourself, you could be with your friend, you could be with your relative, with your children, with your spouse, it doesn't matter. And you walk up to Jeff, you do the Kabbalah Shabbat, Friday night, and you go up to Jeff and say, hey, where can I go eat tonight? I need a place. 
He says, how many are you? One, two, three. Okay. The Schwartzes, they live on this street in Jerusalem. Uh, they, they're ready to, to have you. And you go knock on the door. Knock, knock. Hi, my name is whatever. Jeff Sedell told me to come here. Ah, oh, come right in. You'll be, I guess, you don't know each other. Now, now we're family. Come together, right? This happens in Jewish communities around the world. Friday night after davening, where are you going to eat? Come to me. Everyone knows. There's no Shabbat table or holiday table that's not filled with guests. And I just want you to think how revolutionary this is, right? Because if you go into a typical, I don't know, uh, American home, you know, uh, any home, right? Yeah, you, you invite your, your, your close friends, your relatives, but strangers, poor people who need a place to eat, just come eat in my house. That's a very Jewish thing. Why? Because that's what the holidays are all about. And the Torah says, in the middle of the holidays, you have Rosh Hashanah and Kippur because you have to work on yourself in order to be worthy, in order to be deserve the type of person that will celebrate the holidays properly, which is not just about yourself, but about welcoming uh, others into your home. I just want to get to the um, end of the Torah portion because it doesn't end with the holidays. As I told you, after the holiday, it talks about the menorah. And then there's some final laws. And there's actually a very, uh, a very famous story at the end of the Torah portion, which is about a Jew who cursed the name of God and was put into prison. There's no prison system in the Torah. Because in the Torah, we the Torah has punishment, but not prison systems. The idea is that Torah doesn't really believe in prison systems because when someone's in prison, they're just not fulfilling their purpose. And it's just like, unlike getting a punishment and then going on. If a person forfeited their life because they committed a capital sin, then they lose their life or they just get punished and they go on, they get a penalty but this person they didn't know what to do so he was put into a prison into confinement until he was told his sentence but basically he um committed the sin of blasphemy he cursed god and ultimately he was uh, put to death um the uh that is uh, the over um overview of this week's torah portion and because we're coming to the holiday of Shavuot, which is our next major holiday, I'm just going to take the last five minutes to talk about what I touched upon earlier. And that was, why is it that every single holiday has a commandment? Rosh Hashanah, you have to blow the shofar, and Yom Kippur, you have to fast, and Sukkot, you have to build a sukkah, and all right, Passover, you have to eat matzah. The one holiday is Shavuot, which is coming up in about 24 days from now. And by the way, in Israel, it's a one-day holiday. It's 24 hours. In the diaspora, it's a second day, but it's the only, unlike Pesach and Sukkot, which are seven-day holidays, this is a one-day holiday. Question is, why isn't there any commandment in the Torah what to do on Shavuot? Why is it just a day of holiday without a mitzvah, without a commandment? So in other words, on every holiday, we make a blessing. We made the blessing. Baruch HaTashem HaKadim who commanded us to eat the matzah. Oh, blessed are God commanded us to sit in the sukkah. Blessed are you, God, who commanded us to wave the, the four species. But here there's no commandment. It's customs, as I mentioned, dairy food, learning to relate. And the answer is as follows, that the name of the holiday is Zman Matan Torah Seinu. It's the holiday that the Torah was given. And it's the holiday of Kabbalat HaTorah, that we receive the Torah. In other words, God gave us the Torah. And the God didn't just give us the Torah 3,335 years ago. God gives us the Torah every day. As it says, Asher Natan Lanu, we say the blessing at the Torah, who gave us the living Torah. Baruch HaTashem, Notain, who gives the Torah in the present, not just in the past. So the point is that this is the holiday. You know, everyone knows the teachings of Kabbalah. What does Kabbalah mean? Jewish mysticism. That's not really what Kabbalah means. If you know basic Hebrew, the word Kabel means to receive. Kabbalah is the teachings that have been passed down that we've received. In other words, the whole message of Shavuot 
is that we have to receive. God gives us the Torah, but we have to receive the Torah. Now, what does it mean to receive the Torah? Obviously, it means to learn the Torah, but it means much more than that. It means to imbue the Torah within ourselves and to truly receive something is to act on what you've received. So, you know, people say, oh, I received information. But to really receive it means to internalize it, to incorporate it into your life, to allow it to permeate your being, to transform your nature, to elevate you. And therefore, the, 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 the mitzvah of Shavuos is not to do anything, but to receive. Just like when the Jews stood up on Sunday, they listened and they absorbed and they received. And that's the question that we all have to ask ourselves on Shavuot. God gave the Torah. God gives the Torah. The question is, how much of the Torah are we receiving? When you learn something in the Torah, whether it's a positive commandment that you should do or a negative commandment you shouldn't do, do you just learn it and receive it in your mind intellectually? Or do you receive it in your heart? And do you receive it in your actions? So if you learn about a mitzvah to give charity, or you learn about a mitzvah not to speak gossip, or you learn about a mitzvah to tell that whatever it is, have you really received it? Have you taken it? So Shavuos is not about doing, it's about receiving. And therefore, this, it's, it's, it's the holiday that there is no action that we're commanded to do. In other words, Shavuos were meant to listen, were meant to learn, were meant to hear the Ten Commandments in the synagogue once again and do the most important job. God can give and give and give. But the question is if we're receiving. Just like a parent can teach their child, but the child has to receive it. That is our role, to receive the words of Hashem, the words of the Torah. So thank you all for joining, and I wish everyone a wonderful day, and thank you for being here. Yeah, have any questions? Always welcome questions, but I don't see any questions, so we'll just wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye.